Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Father, I pray that as we come to your word today, that you would give us an appropriate eagerness and receptivity and humility before your word. We want to be fed, and specifically, we want to see more of the glory of Christ. And I pray, Father, that as we consider the arrival of John the Baptist, that as we see what a great child he was and the great mission that you had given him, that we would in turn see the greatness of Jesus Christ. So bless, Father, the time that we have in your word today. May you receive our worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now that we are right in the middle of Christmas season, there are all sorts of different symbols that we see that are connected with Christmas. There's a lot of cultural ones, some of which testify to Christ's birth and other ones which don't. We have jingle bells, we have mistletoe, we have caroling, we have Santa Claus, we have Christmas trees and Christmas stockings and Christmas cookies. And then you have all the different biblical symbols as well. There's the Star of Bethlehem. You have the wise men. You have the shepherds. You have the angels and mangers and swaddling claws. And there's many more symbols that we can mention. But there's one name that's almost never mentioned in connection with the birth of Christ. And that is John the Baptist. Can you think of a single carol, a single Christmas song that includes John the Baptist? I tried to think of one yesterday. I can't think of a single one that includes John the Baptist. Can you think of a, a single Christmas play or Christmas movie that highlights the significance of John the Baptist and the role that he plays in relationship to the coming of Christ? I can't think of a single one. Our culture completely ignores the significance of John the Baptist in regards to the coming of Christ. But the most significant figure in the arrival of Christ in the Christmas story, besides Jesus himself, is not the shepherds, it's not the angels, it's not the wise men, it's not Joseph or even Mary, it's John the Baptist. He's the most significant figure behind Christ. And we really see this highlighted in the gospel according to Luke. What Luke does is he goes back and forth between the arrival of John the Baptist and the arrival of, of Christ. And he compares them and contrasts them. So if, if you have your copy of God's Word, look back at the very beginning of Luke 1. In verses 5 to 25, we see that the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and announces that he and his wife, Elizabeth, will have a son named John. And then in verses 26 to 38, the same angel, Gabriel, appears to Mary and announces that she will conceive by the Holy Spirit and she will give birth to a son named Jesus. In verses 46 to 56, you see Mary, this is what we looked at last week, Mary's song of praise to God for what he's done. And then you see in verses 67 to 80, Zechariah, his song of praise to God for what he's done. In verses 57 to 66, we see the birth of John the Baptist. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we read of the birth of Jesus. So it goes back and forth. John the Baptist, then Jesus. And John the Baptist, and then Jesus. And John the Baptist, and Jesus. The angel Gabriel told Zechariah that their son would be great before the Lord. 
Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 7 that John was a prophet, and he says, and more than a prophet. He was the greatest of all the prophets that had come up to that date. Jesus even said, among all those born among women, which that's a pretty comprehensive category there, that none is greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is incredibly great. And we read that John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And so John's greatness, it serves to magnify the greatness of Jesus Christ. John's relationship to Jesus is like the moon to the sun. The glory of the moon shows forth the glory of the sun. The glory of John the Baptist shows forth the greater glory of Jesus Christ. John functions like a herald who magnifies the greatness of the coming king. And so if you had come to know more of the greatness of the arrival of Jesus Christ, you would do well to look at the greatness of John the Baptist. And that's what we're going to do today. And so we're continuing our songs of Advent. And as Ken mentioned, today we're looking at what's often called the Benedictus, the song of praise from Zechariah that he gave after the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at the whole song, Lord willing, except for the final two verses. And we're going to save those for Christmas Eve because those last two verses, they uh, emphasize well the theme of our Christmas Eve service, which is Jesus is the light of the world. So we'll save those two verses for Saturday night. But what I want you to see from this passage is, see how the arrival of John the Baptist shows forth the greater glory of Jesus Christ. So here's the first truth. The arrival of John the Baptist is a sign of God's grace breaking into our sin-cursed world. Look at verse 57. It says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. But what was the great mercy that God had shown to Elizabeth and to her husband, Zechariah? What was it about the birth of Christ that caused their friends and relatives to rejoice at the arrival of this son? Well, look back at chapter 1, the very beginning of it, in verse 5. Verse 5 begins with these words. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So what we see from these verses is Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were, they were faithful followers of the Lord. They walked by faith. They were obedient to God's commands. They lived before him righteously. And yet, they don't have any child. They had prayed for a child for years, as we'll see in a few verses. They had been praying and praying, but God had never given them a child. And now it seems like not only do they not have a child, but there's no chance that they would have a child. Elizabeth, she's barren, and it says they're both advanced in years. They're both well beyond the years that they can hope that they might have a child. But then we read that one day while Zechariah was serving in the temple, an angel named Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and told him, look at verse 13, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared." Well, what a message this was from the angel Gabriel. Zechariah and Elizabeth are going to have a child in their old, old, old age, but not only will they have a child, but Gabriel says he is going to be great. He'll be great before the Lord. And through the power of the Spirit, he's going to prepare a people who are ready for the Lord. But Zechariah responds to this amazing promise, even though he had been praying for it for years. He responds to this promise 
not with faith and worship, but he responds with distrust and unbelief. He says, how can this be so? If you look at verse 18, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And Gabriel responds with a word of judgment for his unbelief and says in verse 20 that he is going to be silent and unable to speak until the Lord fulfills this word. And so Zechariah departs from the temple. He comes to the crowd who have been praying uh, for him and for the ministry that he was offering up to the Lord at the altar. And they notice he can't communicate. It says that he was making signs to them, trying to communicate to them what had just happened. But he's not able to speak at all. And then we read in verse 24, After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived. She isolates herself for five months, and then as we read in our passage, she has given birth to a son. Now, brothers and sisters, just try to put yourself in their situation. What an amazing miracle this would have been. Imagine for yourself that John and Betty, that they have had no children. And, and we all know, over the years, we've known them a long time, and they've shared at, at prayer meetings, would you please pray for us? We want a child, but God's not given us a child, and so we've been praying and praying and praying. But now a lot of years have passed, and those prayer requests became less and less, and the Lord's not going to give them a child. But then one day, we arrive at church here, and something seems different about John. You go up to him, and you talk to him, and it doesn't seem like he's paying any attention. And then he looks at you, and then he starts making these signs. And then you notice that Betty's not here. And you try to communicate, John, where's your wife? Well, and you find out, well, she's, she's back home. And, and then she's back home for five months. We don't see her until May. And then when she comes, you think, something looks really different with Betty. <laughs> I, I think she ate quite a bit of Christmas treats. And you go up to her and you say, Betty, it's so good to see you. We have, we've missed you. We haven't seen you for a long time. How are you doing? And she says, oh, I'm doing very well. I have something to share with you, and you're not going to believe. The Lord has opened my womb, and I'm pregnant. And then a few months pass by, and then we get a, a record on the, on, the, on the prayer email chain. The time has come. We're, we're, and John, John whisks off Betty to Rutland Hospital. And then the next week, you see Betty holding in her arms this little baby. How amazed would we be if that happened? <laughs> we would be astonished. We would be filled with joy. No wonder the friends and relatives around uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they're rejoicing with her. And yet what I want you to see is, what is it that they see in the significance of John's birth? Well, they merely see it as God's mercy upon Zechariah and Elizabeth. In verse 59, when it was time for the baby to be circumcised, the friends and relatives, they suggested that the name of the baby ought to be Zechariah in honor of his father. What they're probably thinking is, God has blessed Zechariah with a son after all these years. Blessed him with a son in his old age. And now Zechariah, he's been struck mute, and we don't know why. So let's name it in honor of Zechariah. This baby is a testimony of God's grace upon his parents. But Elizabeth refuses and says, no, he will be called John. And they say, well, why? There's none of your relatives that are named John. Well, why was it that Elizabeth knew the baby was to be named John? Remember, the angel had told Zechariah that the baby was to be named John. But how was it that Elizabeth knew this? Well, some have suggested that Zechariah simply told her. That would be an easy explanation. But what we see is that not only was Zechariah mute, he was also deaf. When the crowd asks him about the name in verse, in verse 62, notice they don't speak to him, but they make signs. So they're not able to communicate to him because he can't hear. He can't hear and he can't speak. And also, when the crowd sees Zechariah's response, when he writes down the name, his name is John, what's their response? They're all astonished. They all are in amazement. I don't think that's the response if you know that they've communicated about the name beforehand. They didn't have the easy kind of communication that we have with text messages and things like that. I think what happened here is Elizabeth had revealed to her from the Lord that the name of the baby was to be John. 
I think this is a supernatural revelation that God gave to Elizabeth as well. And immediately, when Zechariah writes, his name is John, after over nine months of not being able to speak and being deaf, Zechariah's mouth is opened up and he praises God. And certainly, one of God's purposes in restoring his speech after such a long time is to fix attention upon this baby. What is the significance of this baby? Not only do you have two people who are well beyond childbearing years that God has supernaturally given them a baby, but now this man, after over nine months of being silent, now when the child is named, now he speaks, who is this child? What's the significance of this child? And we read that fear came upon all the neighbors. They knew this was a mighty revelation of God. News spread all throughout the surrounding region. And everyone asked, what then will this child be? And I think we have a clue in the baby's name. Because that's all the focus in this section here, isn't it? It's the name of this baby. They want to name him in honor of his father. Elizabeth says, no, he shall be called John. Zechariah says, no, his name is John. And then immediately when, immediately when he writes, his name is John, then his mouth is opened. What's the significance of the name John? John, do you know the significance of your name? What your name means? means, that's right, Betty. It means God is gracious. God is gracious. That's what the name means. The crowd saw John the Baptist as simply God's favor upon his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. But John the Baptist, as the forerunner of Christ, is a sign of God's grace upon the world. John the Baptist is a sign of God's favor and kindness upon those who don't deserve it. People who have sinned against God. People who have broken God's law. People who have rebelled against Him. People like me and people like you. And yet God, rather than judging the world, sent his son into the world to save the world, and he signaled his entrance by a baby boy whose very name means God is gracious. John the Baptist's coming is like a billboard for our condemned world to see. Our God is a God who delights in grace. And he has demonstrated this grace by the giving of his son. God's word says in John chapter 1, it says, For from Jesus' fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. That's the first truth that we learn with the significance of John the Baptist and what he tells us about Jesus. The second truth is this. John marks the arrival of the horn of salvation come in the son of David. So when Zechariah's mouth is opened up, his first response is to praise God. And then he sings the Benedictus in our passage. And he begins by saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. With the birth of John, Zechariah says, God has clearly visited his people. And that's a phrase that speaks of God seeing the great need of his people and then manifesting himself to them in a great and powerful way. That same phrase is used when God saw his people Israel in bondage, in captivity in Egypt after so many hundreds of years, and then he raised up a deliverer in Moses to redeem them from their bondage. It says in Exodus 4.31, God visited his people. Well, here Zechariah says, God, in the giving of John the Baptist, has visited his people. With the birth of John, God has visited his people in a powerful way. And he speaks of what God has done in terms of, of a horn of salvation. Look at verse 69. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. It was the angel Gabriel, you remember from last week, that told Mary that her child would be given the throne of David. Jesus would fulfill God's prophecy to David that one of its descendants would sit on the throne and would reign as God's vice regent forever and ever. And here, Zechariah says that the Messiah to be born, Jesus Christ, that he's going to be a horn of salvation. Now, speaking of Christmas phrases that aren't used very often, that's another one that's not used very often. We don't see that in Christmas cards. We don't see that in the carols we sing that Jesus is the promised horn of salvation. But really, we should. Well, 
because this entire song is really all emphasizing that Jesus is the horn of salvation. Well, what does that mean for him to be the horn of salvation? Well, a horn speaks of power and strength. You think of an animal that has a horn, like a bighorn sheep or a rhinoceros, their horn is a symbol of their strength. And so for God to have raised up in Jesus, the son of David, a horn of salvation, it's speaking of God raising up a powerful work of salvation against all of the enemies of the people of God. This phrase is used in Psalm 18, verse 2, by David in the day that he was delivered from his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he says of God that God is the horn of my salvation. So you think of how David, how he was running and fleeing from Saul and how he was so vulnerable and uh, so helpless, and Saul is so powerful and trying to kill David, and yet God delivers him. And David says, God has raised up this mighty salvation, this horn of salvation. Well, that's what Zechariah is saying about the coming of Jesus Christ. He is a horn of salvation. Matthew Henry says, it's a powerful salvation. The strength of the beast is his horn. He has raised up such a salvation as shall pull down his spiritual enemies and protect us from them. Well, you might ask, well, what is it about the horn of salvation that makes this so great? Let me give you four reasons from Zechariah's song. First, he's according to God's prophesied plan. Verse 70, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. This horn of salvation in the line of David, it wasn't something that just came about or something that just happened. It's all according to God's prophesied plan. God spoke of this mighty salvation that the son of David would bring in many places, but consider Psalm 118. Listen to what it says, starting in verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. And then down in verse 17, it says, there I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. So God gave this prophecy hundreds upon hundreds of years earlier. And now it's arrived in Jesus Christ. That's what Zechariah is thinking. All these prophecies of this mighty salvation that's going to come, the salvation that comes against all odds, as it were, it's arrived in Jesus Christ. He is that prophesied horn of salvation. And so what this means is that you don't have to doubt that Christ is indeed the horn of salvation. You can embrace it cheerfully and eagerly because God prophesied it beforehand. So it's all according to God's sure plan. Here's a second truth about what makes the horn of salvation so great. And this is really the center of it. As the horn of salvation, he brings salvation from our enemies. Look at verse 71. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Well, who are the, who are the enemies that Jesus as the horn of salvation saves his people from? Well, there are many people in Jesus' day that thought that the Messiah would save them from the Romans. They thought the Romans were under their control, were under their tyranny. They, they are the ultimate enemy. They thought that their fundamental problem was other people. And you hear this in politics today. The fundamental problem that we have is the politicians on the other side. The fundamental problem that we have is Hillary Clinton or George Soros or the deep state or Donald Trump. That's our fundamental problem in our nation. That's what's wrecking our nation. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6.12 that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against Satan and his evil forces. That's our ultimate enemy. Satan is the god of this age who blinds the minds of unbelievers and seeks to bring souls to everlasting ruin. And Satan's weapons are always the same. He's a tempter and then he's an accuser. He's a tempter in that he, he tells lies about God and the goodness of God and about the word of God and he tempts us to disobey God. And then when we have disobeyed God, then Satan pounces upon us with accusation. And he, he weighs us down with the guilt that we truly have, and he accuses us before God. He's a tempter, and he is an accuser. And because of our sin, we are helpless before the devil. We can't overcome the devil at all. 
We need a mighty Savior. Praise God, then, that Jesus is the horn of our salvation. He came to defeat the devil by saving us from our sin. Matthew 1.21 says this, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their what? From their sins. Jesus came to save us from our sins by laying down his life on the cross. There he took the place of sinners, suffering God's wrath for our sins in his body. On the cross, Jesus suffered and bled and died. And then on the third day, he rose again from the dead, never to die again, showing that the true and full complete payment had been paid on the cross. So that any and all who turn from their sin, confessing their sin, and look to Christ in faith, that they will receive the benefits of Christ's salvation. Christ's blood that he shed for sin, that it will be true for you, that it will cover your sins, and the result is you are forgiven. And if our sin is dealt with, then Satan is undone. Because that's the authority that Satan has over us, is our sin. But if our sin is dealt with, then Jesus, in saving us from our sins, he has disarmed the devil. Listen to what it says in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. God made, to, made us alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. And that's speaking of spiritual rulers and authorities. He disarmed the devil and the demons, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, then you no longer are under the tyranny of the devil. You no longer are in your sin, for you have been forgiven. Satan has been disarmed. And there's a line, actually a verse, in the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that highlights this so beautifully. It says, O come thou rod of Jesse free, that's speaking of Jesus being the son of David. Jesse was the father of David. O come thou rod of Jesse free, thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save and give them victory o'er the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. So what this means is Jesus is the horn of salvation that has defeated our enemies. And our greatest enemy is Satan himself. Third truth here is that Jesus, as the horn of salvation, fulfills God's oath to Abraham. Verses 72 to 73. To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us. And then it continues. So what's being said here is that Jesus, being the horn of salvation, that it fulfills God's promises to the fathers and his oath to Abraham. And the oath that's being spoken of here is given to us in Genesis 22, when God said to Abraham, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sands that is on the seashore. We heard about this in, in the book of Hebrews. God here not only promises it, but he also swears with the oath. He says, by myself I have sworn. I will surely bless you, Abraham, and that blessing is for Abraham and all his descendants, of whom we are a part through Jesus Christ. And so what this means here in this passage with Christ being the fulfillment of the oath is we can trust that what God had promised has come to pass. God's not only promised that it would come to, to pass, and brothers and sisters, can God lie? No, he can't. And God has also sworn with an oath by himself, and there's not a higher standard to swear by. So God has brought what he promised and what he swore to pass. He's brought this horn of salvation. And then a final truth here with the significance of Jesus being the horn of salvation is he comes that we might serve the Lord. Verses 74 and 75. That we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So notice, the purpose of Jesus coming as our mighty Savior and redeeming us from the power of the devil is not so that we then can do what we want to do. 
that we can th then live in our own sinful desires. Because that's not freedom. Jesus has come so that we, being freed from the tyranny of the devil, that we might serve God. That's where true liberty is found. Just as the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt so that they might serve the Lord, so you have been given a far greater salvation for the purpose that you might serve the Lord. Jesus loves you too much to leave you in your sin. He saves you and fills you with his spirit so that you might become more and more truly human. And truly human is determined by whom? The true man, Jesus Christ. Look at what it says in Ephesians 4.24. It says, To put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So here we see a full salvation that the horn of salvation brings. He delivers us from the tyranny of the devil, all according to God's prophesied plan, all according to God's oath, so that we might live in the freedom of obeying God and serving the Lord. That's true freedom. Well, here's the final point, and this is a very brief point. John is the long-awaited forerunner of the Lord, come to give knowledge of salvation. Verses 76 and 77. It says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways and to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. This is an amazing truth here. We commonly refer to John the Baptist by that name, but a better title would be John the Forerunner. That's really who he was. He was the forerunner. He would be commissioned to prepare the way of the Lord, to bring the message of salvation in the forgiveness of sins. And John did this by preaching a message of repentance. His message was summed up, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He prepared the way of the Lord. And John's mission as a forerunner highlights how important Jesus is. Because who did John come to make a people prepared for? Who did John come to make a people prepared for? Now, if your first response is, well, Jesus. He's the forerunner of Jesus. But look at what it says in verses 76 and 77. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for he will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. He'll go before whom? The Lord. And this fulfills the prophecy in Isaiah 40, verse 3, which says this. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So who did John the Baptist come to prepare the way for? The Lord, who is God. And if, Jesus is the, if John is the forerunner of Jesus, then what does that say about Jesus? He is the Lord, who is God. He is no mere man from Nazareth. He is no mere carpenter's supposed son. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He came to prepare the way of Yahweh himself, seen in the Son of the Most High, Jesus Christ. So the ministry of John as a forerunner puts a bright spotlight on how, on how awesome Jesus is. It shows that Jesus is none other than the Lord. So what does John the Baptist tell us about Jesus? It tells us that it's very, by his very name that God's grace has come to us. He tells us that God has raised up a horn of salvation in Jesus, the son of David, over the great enemy of the devil. It tells us that as a forerunner, that Jesus is none other than the Lord Most High. So how then would God have you respond? How would God have you respond to this message of the greatness of Jesus and how, how, how he highlights the greatness of Jesus Christ. I think I said the greatness of John, how he highlights the greatness of Jesus Christ. He would have you imitate the example of Zechariah. Imitate the example of Zechariah. Learn from his wrong example, how he first responded to this good news with what? With doubt, questions. How can this be? And what did God do? He struck him mute and deaf for over nine months. Zechariah, if you're going to use your voice in that regard to have fear and questions and unbelief, then I'll silence you. That's not what your voice is for, Zechariah. And then when God fulfills the word and the son is born and he's named John, God is gracious, what is the first thing that Zechariah does? He praises God. You wonder in those months, 
What was Zechariah thinking about? No doubt there was repentance going on in his heart. But also, as he saw his wife conceive, as he saw his wife's belly growing bigger, and then he, then he held his son, God has kept his promise. He has raised up a horn of salvation. So our response should be the same as Zechariah's response. And we should praise God for his salvation. Matthew Henry says, When God opens your lips, your mouth must show forth his praise. Your tongue is most your glory when it is employed for God's glory. So do you see the glory of what God has done in Jesus Christ? Would you rightly give him glory for his incredible grace that he has shown in the sending of his son? Then open your mouth. Open your mouth with the church family and open your mouth at home. Testify of what a great God is and how amazing his grace is that he sent his son. Open your mouth with your spouse. Open your mouth before your children. Let them hear from you, their father, their mother. Children, we celebrate this time of year because God has been gracious and he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, that we might be saved. Let them hear you testify of God's greatness. Open your mouth before your coworkers. Testify before them. Let them know that you are, you are the employee that is the follower of Christ. You are the Christian amongst the group. Don't let them guess. Let them know you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth amongst your enemies. Open your mouth and testify of God's greatness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the great gift that you have given in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, there's just so many truths and we, it's, it's as if we're seeing through a glass darkly right now. So many glorious truths. But Father, what we do see, we are amazed by. We are amazed by. We pray that you give us more light. That, that we would be encouraged and strengthened um, by, what, by what a great gift you have given in your Son, Jesus Christ. And what a mighty Savior he is. Father, I pray that if there's any here today that they don't know you and... They've come here today burdened because of what they've done, burdened because of their sin. I pray that they would realize that though sin is strong and though the devil is mighty, that you have raised up a far greater Savior in Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And Jesus is able, by his grace, to forgive and pardon and cleanse, fill them with his spirit, and to bring them to God if they would repent and if they would believe. And so I pray, Father, that they might be drawn to you even today. We thank you and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen.